I need a clicker. Yeah, perfect. All right, guys. Thank you very much for inviting me. Super glad to be here. I want to thank the legendary Daniel for organizing the show. And uh, let's talk about blockchain and why blockchain is so important and important for me personally. So I want to start by telling you all a story from when I was young. So it was a cold December night. My parents and I, we were standing in this huge queue and we were freezing, it was very cold. And in this queue, there were people from different uh, societal classes, rich people, poor people, doesn't matter. Everyone was in this huge queue. And you might be wondering, what kind of queue was it? Well, we were all living in Belarus and we were waiting for the ATM because we wanted to withdraw dollars because our own national currency was crashing. And we moved to Sweden 2006, but my whole uh, childhood, uh, this is how I experienced poverty based on hyperinflation, corruption and, so, and financial exclusion. How many of you have seen this picture? How many of you know what this picture means? How many of you have seen this before? So what is it? speaks to the fact that blockchain is the potential to eliminate poverty. Yeah, and, but this particular picture is from the UN. So the number one goal, sustainability goal of the UN, is to decrease poverty. And for me, blockchain is a very, very good solution because a lot of poverty is because of one, hyperinflation, two, corruption, and three, financial exclusion. Another reason why blockchain is so important and so exciting, why so many people are drawn into this field nowadays, is because it's a mixture of three very, very important and interesting fields. Namely society, everyone has a political view, everyone has some kind of notion about society and how society will develop, economics and technology. And therefore, it is a very, very exciting field that many people are attracted to today. So, who am I? My name is Ivan. I'm a software developer. I worked at Ericsson. I worked as a freelancer software developer as well. And I run a YouTube channel all about blockchain, Ivan on Tech. And in just a couple of months, we grew from zero to now 70,000 subscribers very soon. And I'm also traveling all around the world. I just came back from New York educating companies, organizations, and governments about blockchain. Also, my partners and I are starting our new company called Stockholm Blockchain, where we will invest in blockchain technology, in startups and in public companies, and also educate organizations, companies and governments about this new field. So, can anyone tell me the similarities between these words? Even if you don't know what blockchain is, what is similar between internet and radio? Come on guys, just raise up your hand and tell me. Anyone who has any idea what is the similarity between internet and radio? Please. Communication. Communication, very good. Transmission. Very good. Borderless. Borderless, perfect. Also, no central authority, no permissions. If you want, you just start a website. If you have an idea, just build it. The same is with radio, you just transmit. Of course, there are some frequency restrictions, but the basic idea is the same, that it's a decentralized network open for everyone and no one is stopping you from using these technologies. Well, blockchain is very much like that. It's also open, it's also borderless, it's all about the communication, it's a decentralized network where, in which everyone can participate. And the beauty of this network is that it is all based on incentives. You might have heard about uh, Bitcoin, the most popular and well-known blockchain project. And this project really introduced the concept of a blockchain to the world. And you may know that this is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cash system, de uh, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency. And without having a central bank, without having a central authority, how can you trust each other? How can, how can you trust the, the different nodes in the system that everyone is honest? Well, it comes down to incentives. This system is built in such a way that everyone is incentivized to be honest and to be true to the system and to follow the rules. Uh, and this is the beauty for me. 
when it comes to blockchain. The technological beauty of the blockchain that it's all about incentives and it is this clever, clever system that a person or an organization or a group of people have come up with and they are called Satoshi Nakamura. I'm sure you've heard of him or, the, or them. And they published a paper in 2008 uh, openly on the internet, not, uh, not going through the academic way of doing research, just open published on the internet and they described the system of incentives and they described Bitcoin which was this, which is uh, this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency. And so that was 2008. How many of you know this man? Some people know, or I can just, can you tell me what, uh, uh, who he is? He created Ethereum, the, yes. the open source blockchain. Correct. Solution. Anyone knows his name? Vitalik Buterin. So this is a Canadian a Russian guy and so uh, if we go back to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a cash system, it's a currency, we can send money to each other, that's all good, but we also can program. We can also add simple logic. So there is a scripting language in Bitcoin. For example, an example of such script uh, program could be that you and I, we start a company together and we have an account with Bitcoins. But you don't want me to just spend these Bitcoins on my own. And I don't want you to spend these Bitcoins on your own. So what we do is that we create a script that requires us both to sign a transaction in order for it to be executed. So this is just an example of very simple scripting capabilities that Bitcoin has. But the designers of Bitcoin intentionally made it so that you cannot write very complex applications. It's all very simple. It's a very simple and dumb scripting language and it is so for a reason. But so what Vitalik proposed, he worked with blockchain, he worked with Bitcoin, he proposed to the Bitcoin community that, come on guys, let's add a general purpose Turing complete language. And when we say Turing complete language, we mean a language that can basically do anything. It can uh, calculate any mathematical calculation. But the Bitcoin community did not agree. And uh, Vitalik started Ethereum, which is a decentralized platform for decentralized applications. So if you think about blockchain as an iPhone, you can think that Bitcoin is an app on that iPhone. What Vitalik wanted to do is to build this platform, Ethereum, which is an iPhone, but you can program any application for this iPhone and it will run in this decentralized manner, much like Bitcoin, the currency, is running in a decentralized manner. Vitalik created Ethereum and now we all can write applications on the blockchain. They will run in a decentralized manner. So that is how Ethereum was born. And this is how this whole revolution really accelerated. Uh, and this also, of course, opens up so many possibilities for the industry, for the governments to really use this technology. Because now Vitalik gave us the tools to utilize the blockchain technology and to write our own application. And there's also Ethereum uh, Enterpri Enterprise Alliance, which is a group of companies, group of banks, very large institutions working together to improve this technology. This technology is open source and this doesn't mean that these companies are closing this technology for themselves. It means that they all collaborate and improve these open source projects and discover new use cases for, for themselves and for the industry. Uh, companies such as JP Morgan are a, a part of this uh, alliance. Of course, there are many industries that will be disrupted. My favorite three picks for the industries that I'm completely sure will be disrupted are finance, insurance, and law. Let's start with finance. Let's talk a bit about finance. I know that there are some uh, bankers here, some finance people. And what I think is very interesting, uh, and this got me thinking when I read the book Internet of Money by Andreas Antonopoulos, which I highly, highly recommend all of you read. So he, he pointed out this generational difference that we will soon experience. Because we need to keep in mind that currently we have 14 years old, 13 years old, already using Bitcoin. And they're sending it to each other because it's very easy. You download an app and now you're a part of the financial system. You don't have to wait until you until you are 18 to get your bank account. So when these people grow up and they turn 18 and they come into a bank and they will get their first card and then they will be told, you know what, if you want to send money to Africa or to Indonesia, it will take three days. Of course, those people will tell, tell us, have you heard about Bitcoin? Why? Why is it so? And so finance is a very, very 
big industry that absolutely will be disrupted. Insurance. Claudia mentioned a bit about I uh, IoT, Internet of Things, and blockchain, uh, and I want to elaborate a bit more. A lot of the problems we see in insurance in, is that there is some kind of assessment that needs to be done by a middleman. If your car crashes, someone needs to assess the damage and then maybe you'll get your insurance. Well, if we have sensors in the car, we have sensors all over the place, devices talking to each other, and they can report what happened to the blockchain, to the smart contracts running on the blockchain, well, we have eliminated the middleman and the insurance industry is disrupted as well. Law. Very, very big industry as well. Uh, when we have smart contracts, for example, uh, let's, let's think about a very simple smart contract that we might want to write together. Let's imagine that you're all my parents and you want me to inherit your money when you're dead. So we can together, we can write this smart contract that um, you, you put your money into the smart contract because the smart contract can't hold money. And then you check in once a year to the smart contract to tell the contract that you're still alive. And then if you don't check in for two years, I'll get your money as the inheritance. So currently we need to use an escrow service to do this. But now we can do it on the blockchain and the smart contract will handle this transaction. But of course, if I'm a programmer and you're not the programmer and we need to code the smart contract on Ethereum, for example, uh, you might be tricked. So of course, we will need lawyers who have a computer science background who can code on Ethereum, who can code on LISC or NEO or some other decentralized uh, platform that will be used in the future. Fundraising. This is also extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, we will have an interactive uh, uh, part here as well. Uh, who knows what this chart represents? It says on the picture, but ha have you seen it before? Yes. Who, who can tell me what it means? Uh, not really. <laughs> but so, all right, so on Ethereum, you and I, we can issue our own cryptocurrencies. How many of you know how many cryptocurrencies there are today? Uh, yeah, over a thousand. Exactly. It's, it's an insane amount. And so when we want to publish our own cryptocurrency, we do something called an ICO. Uh, and this is when we release our coin and people can buy it. And we might release our coin for several reasons. Maybe it is used in our DAP, decentralized application, for some reason. Or maybe we want to release our shares in our company as tokens and it will be as a cryptocurrency. And so what this graph represents is how much money was raised in ICOs altogether. And as you can see, here is May. And it has completely exploded during this summer. It's a really an insane explosion in ICOs and how much money this new way of raising money uh, attracts. And of course, this is also a very interesting article from August that ICOs have surpassed VC in the early stage. And as you can see, it was at 1.2 billion, and now we're at 2.5 billion. So this article was amazing and exciting, but it was somewhere here. I mean, now we're here. So this is really the future of fundraising. And coming back to financial exclusion, currently, if you live in parts of the world where there is not a lot of capital, even if you are very smart, you're passionate, you have all the knowledge, it will be hard for you to raise money. But with ICOs, you are a part of the global economy. There is no borders anymore. And this is why I think it's so, so exciting currently. Of course, if you are a part of the current blockchain community, you are aware that this is kind of wild, wild west currently. There are many scams, people just publishing a PDF and then they attract so much money. But it just, it's just a question of time. This will mature and I'm almost 100% sure that this is the future of fundraising, ICOs and issuing digital tokens. Let's talk about the future. So everything we talked about up until now has, uh, yeah, it, it has happened up, up until now. So let's look in the, into the future instead. Uh, of course, many, many more businesses and industries will learn about these uh, technologies. Currently, not a lot of people know about this. And uh, it's amazing that so many people are here and are interested. But for example, I was just uh, a couple of weeks ago at a law firm and I tried to explain to them that 
Guys, you know, smart contracts, you really have to learn this because a lot of law will be on smart contracts. And the lawyer replied to me, yeah, yeah, smart contracts. We already use that. We use Scribe all the time. And I was like, no, no, it's not about Scribe. It's about blockchain. It's an entirely different thing. So a lot of people do not know that currently and a lot of education will need to be done. But in the future, more and more businesses and industries will understand the value of this and will use it more and more to save costs and to really be at the forefront uh, when it comes to competition. Crypto equity. This is extremely, extremely interesting as well. Why don't we give out equity shares in our companies as a token? I mean, number one, it's so much easier, so much less friction. Number two, these tokens can be programmable and can do anything. For example, we can have a board meeting on the blockchain. I can be in Africa, you can be in Indonesia, someone else can be in Norway. And we can all together log into a website. The browser will recognize how many tokens we each have in this uh, company and we have a board meeting online. Everyone proposes some proposal that the company will go in this direction and then or that direction and then people can vote. So crypto equity will be huge and now uh, more and more people are discovering these possibilities and how much easier it is to use crypt cryptocurrencies to issue stocks, to issue shares instead of doing it the old way. So crypto equity is something you definitely should look into. Uh, of course, as we mentioned, this huge explosion in ICOs have attracted the attention of uh, regulators and uh, governments. So China, they have banned ICOs, at least temporarily, because they want to have some kind of control. And uh, it's, I think it's naive to think that regulators will not touch cryptocurrencies. It will only continue and we will see more and more regulations. So this is why I have China here. And China is a huge player into, in the cryptocurrency market. And they have a lot to lose if they just kill it with regulations. So in my personal view, I think they're just looking at these new trends and seeing how they will react. But they have banned ACOs, at least temporarily. What I think is exciting and why I'm so proud to be Swedish is because Sweden is doing a lot of blockchain development. We have our land registry uh, being moved to the blockchain. Estonia is doing a lot of blockchain development as well. And this will only accelerate because there is no reason to not have public information on the blockchain. Information that should be public, why wouldn't you put it on the blockchain? And I think that it will be a standard. United Nations will just accept it as a standard. And if you have a country and your public information is not on the blockchain, why so? Do you have something to hide? I think it will just be suspicious that you don't use the blockchain technology. That being said, guys, this slide is mainly for YouTube. Uh, if you have missed this event in Stockholm, I would love to see you in Singapore at Block Show Asia or in Lithuania at Build Stuff. In Lithuania, we're going to talk about the security of smart contracts and discuss the different hacks we've had. And in Singapore, we're going to talk about Bitcoin scalability. And guys, if you want to know more about what I do, follow me on YouTube, Ivan on Tech. If you have questions, want to connect anything, contact at ivanontech.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.